Hello, my name is Ali Verji, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event hosted by the Africa Program at the United States Institute of Peace, USIP. For more than 35 years, USIP has been dedicated to the proposition that a world without violent conflict is possible, practical, and essential for US and global security. In today's USIP event, we'll be discussing the two most important political transitions in Africa today, those that are concurrently ongoing in Ethiopia and Sudan. Both Ethiopia and Sudan are experiencing moments of great promise, but also great peril. And while these two tenuous transitions are clearly different in many respects, there are also a number of striking parallels from how each transition is experienced outside of the center beyond the capitals to the internal tensions within each country, to the state of how inclusive the transitions are, to the economic and environmental pressures, and most recently, the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, both direct and indirect. Now, today's event is a little bit experimental. It's organized in two parts. First, we will hear from interviews I conducted earlier with each of our four guests, Emma Begatachu, the Ethiopia Country Program Manager at the Life and Peace Institute, and Aaron Masho, one of Ethiopia's leading journalists, both in Addis Ababa. Speaking about Sudan, are two of my colleagues at USIP, Manal Taha, the Sudan Program Advisor, and Peyton Knopf, Senior Advisor to the Africa Program. In the second half of the event, our four speakers will join me live to respond to your questions. So please send in your queries now to us on YouTube using the chat box function or on Twitter with the hashtag tenuous transitions. So first to Sudan, I began by speaking with Manal Taha and Peyton Knopf and asked them for their reflections on the last year in Sudan, the year since the Sudanese revolution occurred. If the transitional government want to do the reform, only in Khartoum is not gonna be successful transitional period. The revolution did not start in Khartoum. The revolution in Sudan started in the regions where people revolt against Bashir, demanding change and reform. I think that Consolidation of revolution's achievements depends on what happened throughout the country, specifically in these regions, not only just in Khartoum. And the achievements could be like actually measured by to what extent people in these regions see some reform and changes in their daily life and in institutions that they are dealing with day by day. I believe if there is and a specific complexity and threat that the four war is opposing to this to stability in this transition is because there isn't a specific elements in the four war that demand more work and attention from the government, starting from the uh, legislation reform, security sector reform, economic reform, so they can see really some changes happening in terms of the reforming and people life change in these war zones and in other zones too. Talking about security sector reform is not a new thing in Sudan. What makes it so difficult to achieve in Darfur, for example? The security reform, it's more complicated in Darfur. You have the, all too many arms groups and it's very challenging. Uh, if it's uh, for the transition, if there is no addressing for other security reform and armed groups in Darfur. Hayden, how do you evaluate the year that has passed since the revolution took place? On the one hand, the expectations for the pace of change have inevitably been somewhat unrealistic since Bashir was deposed from power a little over a year ago. But on the other hand, there's this real sense of opportunity for renewal and the possibility of reinvigorating Sudanese pride and culture and patriotism in a way that was tarnished by the brutality and oppression of the previous um, regime. And despite what could have been a vacuum after Bashir was deposed, uh, somewhat encouragingly, the various factions involved in both his removal from power and in the establishment of the transitional arrangement that we have today have demonstrated with somewhat halting progress, a nonetheless a remarkable ability to balance competing interests and ambitions in a way that at least to date has certainly avoided the worst case scenarios of state fragmentation or a severe escalation of violence. Manal, you wrote recently in an article for USIP that 
youth and women have largely been unrepresented in the transition in Sudan. You said the lack of youth engagement and the limited participation of women is a notable weakness of the transitional government. Women and youth appear to be in the back seat of today's processes. So what really has changed for women in Sudan? We have the courage to speak. As Sudanese women now, they have the courage to speak up. So that's, that was not there before during the uh, past regime, which is the big changes. Now women can speak up, they can demand their rights, and also they can build alliances, and also they can talk with other women about women issues. And there will, there's some women reach up to the prime minister talking about why women on the table, not in the table. If you see now, they can raise their voice, which is, which is very good. Still, we have a long way to go. Uh, women, so there is women have a long way to go to achieve what they want. Women are not lucky, unfortunately, because there is not a lot of being changed. And for my, in my opinion, that's not because there is no political will. Could be like there's a political will. There is an, a very inactive voices coming from women, but it goes back to structural, social structure of the Sudan, Sudan it's Sudanese culture itself. Sudan is a patriarchal culture. So it's very hard for women to navigate their way up in that culture. And that is required a structural reform, structural work on the culture itself. And that's actually now reflected in many ways. It reflects now, it reflects on the, even the political and the institutional uh, structure itself. For political parties in Sudan, for example, it's very, it's still, it's adopting the patriarchal model. Most of them, majority, you know, if they are not all, all of, if they are not all of them, this patriarchal culture is adopted by the institutions, for example, the political parties itself. And then the government, um, the government institutions, and then the decision-making itself. Also, it goes through a lot of it heavily influenced by the patriarchal norms. For example, if, you have now the gov- state governance. Women, they submit their resumes and the, the counterpart male submit their resumes. You find that they look at women's resume with critical eyes, with more critical eyes and length than they look at the resume of male uh, candidate. And that's actually, it goes back to the way that they value women, the, the culture itself. So there's not a lot of luck for women, unfortunately, unless there is like a structural change. And what I see now, in Sudan, very important part is missing. I can see it, I'm a Sudanese woman myself. The woman to woman solidarity, regardless of the political affiliation, regardless of the institutional affiliation, woman to woman solidarity is the first step for women to claim some of the power. And that needs to be consolidated and that needs to be worked out as a part of fine women, part of any institutions, any decision making. Woman to woman solidarity is the first step on that ladder. Let's turn now to Ethiopia. Aaron Masho, if you think back to the first days of Abiy Ahmed becoming prime minister of Ethiopia and the sense of optimism and change that existed in those early days, how have things changed today? That sense of optimism was conspicuous across the country with Abiy's appointment. And his rally, his first rally in the centre of Addis encapsulated that. You had a rally that took place in the center of Addis in Mesco Square that attracted tens of thousands of people, many of which broke down in tears as he spoke of democracy and reconciliation. But those days are long gone now. And what we've had ever since is a country that's that's turned quite fragile, a country which is just being ravaged by an escalation of ethnic tensions and rivalry. And this has led, uh, in the last three years, to the displacement of around 3 million people. I mean, we've had displacements in the country, in particular in the East, for some time now, but that was largely down to climate change or, 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 you know, uh, droughts. What is now, what makes this different is it's displacement uh, that resulted from ethnic violence. So you've had, you had this ethnic violence taking place across the country. The number of displaced was in some sense shocking, but what is the situation with the displacement today? The numbers have gone down, largely because the government itself has pressured displaced populations to return back to to their communities. However, it does not mean that there won't be further 
eruptions of violence uh, in the future. And for now, coronavirus, the pandemic, has caused a lull in this violence. But the conditions are already there, and it's clear that the government is struggling to ease tensions across uh, communities. So the big question we have now is, of course, on the ground, there's the palpable fear in the country over how this is going to play out at a time of transition and also further down the line when elections are eventually held. Emma Bet, let's bring you into the conversation. Some people have criticized the trajectory of the political transition in Ethiopia. If you think back to the first days of Abiy Ahmed becoming prime minister, how have things changed in your mind? What are the risks to the political transition today? Now, two years later, the government is trying to claw back and consolidate its power and uh, to try to build institutions in its own reflection or mirror image. And in this process of consolidation and in the, in the effort of building its resilience and gain back control, it seems that um, clashes of some this sort are inevitable and point in case Western Oromia and you see a lot of uh, military interventions in some part of the country to quell tensions and also violence. The relationship between the state and non-state actors will continue to change and to shift. And if there is no further checks and balances in place, we might see a scenario to backslide into authoritarianism and also maybe a kind of amorphed state of a hybrid regime where you have the combination of autocratic features and also a democratic ones. Recently, the two major Oromo affiliated parties, the Oromo Liberation Front, the OLF, and the Oromo Federalist Congress, OFC, asserted that contrary to the early days when the current leadership assumed office and promised to open the political space, it has taken actions in recent months that have reversed those early positive changes. Intimidation, mass incarceration of party leaders and members all point to a return to the old authoritarian days. And that's a quote. Emma Bet, do you agree with that assessment? I partly uh, tend to agree with that statement and assessment, but my assessment is also that it's too early to tell that democracy has arrived in Ethiopia, simply because you need to look at democracy um, in a spectrum between what we call authoritarianism and democracy and anything uh, in between the two. And we have maybe, might, we might have slightly shifted away from the heavy handedness rule, but it doesn't mean that we are in a state of democracy simply because we didn't build the infrastructure, we didn't build the enabling conditions for democracy to flourish. The, this challenge is also yet come with due to the fact that right at the beginning with the new transition or political dispensation, you know, the Ethiopia Center was incoherent. And that lack of coherence and uncertainty, especially within the ruling party, be it in terms of ideology, be it uh, philosophy, and the path or the kind of end destination where the party needs to go was not uh, clear. And that incoherence was something to be seen as a big factor. Emma Bet, we heard earlier about the situation for women in Sudan. Now in Ethiopia, women have been appointed as president of the republic, chief justice, head of the electoral board, the cabinet is gender balanced. These are all achievements that have received a lot of praise, a lot of notice. But what has changed for women more broadly in Ethiopia since the political transition began? The appointments in and of itself are a very good gesture, a very important sign that Ethiopia is also ready to have this inclusion of women in different key positions. What I think you asked about the implications for women in general in society is it's going to be a long way ahead of us because it has been historically and also deeply entrenched beliefs, values of women occupying political, economic positions or have the value uh, to contribute in society. And I think more, more than half of the uh, population being women, I think the uh, women who are in these key positions will be important to have uh, contribute to women policies that are relevant and are beneficial to women in different 
sections of the society. So I can't say now that things have changed for sure for women who are not in, in this visible places. And if you are working on the economy, if you are working on the political representation, it's a matter of time, but uh, this little efforts will be building up or piling up and helping women also to improving women's lives in general in society. So I, I, I think these gestures are very important and it's, it's important also to replicate it, not only at the highest level, but also at the very local level, I would say. Hayden, let's turn back to Sudan. We heard earlier from Manal about the difficulty of security sector reform in Darfur. One of the most important actors in the revolution that removed Omar al-Bashir was the Sudanese army. And in addition to the army, Sudan also has had a very powerful intelligence service, as well as the so-called rapid support forces that had militia origins in Darfur, but are now a national entity. It's clear in the transition that the military-civilian cooperation hasn't always been smooth. How do you feel Sudan's security sector has changed compared to Bashir Sudan? When we look now over the last 12, 13 months since he was deposed, the primary change in the security sector and the security landscape is that the various security entities and the leadership of them is now much more diffuse uh, than it was before uh, April of last year. And the conventional wisdom uh, in Sudan is that the transition is a binary contest between military and civilian actors, which in many ways, it's actually the divisions within these camps now in the context of the transition that are the more important part of the story, uh, not just on the security sector, but with regards to economic uh, reforms. And in fact, one of the thorniest issues will not surprisingly be the extent to which various security entities remain enmeshed in the private sector in a way that is impeding the reforms necessary for dealing with the economic crisis, frankly, which was the proximate cause of the demonstrations and certainly preceded uh, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, but it are going to be exponentially exacerbated um, by it. So it's a bit hard to see success, quote unquote, uh, if one defines it as one of winners and losers. So as we look forward, in my view at least, it's going to be critical that there's a process that builds a new consensus around the purpose of the security services in a democratic society that gives equal emphasis both to the importance of civilian oversight and to the role that security entities rightly play in a functioning government that is providing security for the country's citizens, for the Sudanese people, as opposed to the Sudanese government. Payton, even before the coronavirus, Sudan's economy was in serious trouble, certainly contributed to the fall of the previous government, and it remains a serious threat to the success of the transitional government today, not to mention to millions of Sudanese. What do you make of the economic reforms that have been attempted so far. It's been a bit disappointing, I have to say, both on the international side, but but also the discourse between the international community and the major donors, including the United States, and the transitional government on economic reform. It's stagnated to, to some degree. I, I don't think it's uh, unfair to say, uh, even before, as you said, the pandemic or the implications thereof became clear. On the one hand, as the pandemic unfolds, that's obviously can be quite devastating to, to not have seen more, more concrete economic reforms and frankly more concrete international assistance for those reforms. But at the same time, the pandemic, I think, also provides what could be a necessary sort of reality check and an opportunity to kind of reset this discussion on economic reform uh, and on international assistance. The Sudanese economy was in dire straits to begin with. And when you look at the sort of second and third order consequences of the pandemic, whether it's uh, and related economic challenges globally, whether it's the plunge in oil prices, the near complete cessation of remittances from the West and from the Gulf into Sudan, of which is an important part of the economy, and the other challenges of food insecurity, etc. It may less be the health emergency and more the economic emergency or worsening economic emergency. That's the real challenge for Sudan. And so I think that suggests is that both the transitional government and the international community need to think much more creatively, much more agilely, and really uh, sort of rise above a number of the assumptions that had guided the economic discussion to date, and think both bigger and more boldly about how to best inoculate Sudan against what inevitably is going to be a spiraling economic crisis. Aaron, can I ask you about the economy in Ethiopia? The Abiy government has made the need for economic reform very prominent. 
it is argued that the current state-led economic development model needed to be reformed. Indeed, Abbey's renamed political party is called the Prosperity Party. Government advisors have spoken about the need to increase the role of the private sector. And now, of course, we have the coronavirus, which throws all sorts of assumptions in the air. But before we come to the impact of the coronavirus on the economy, can I ask you to evaluate how successful the economic reform strategy has been so far? It's still early days. All the announcements have made have been made. And, and of course, committees or, or a panel of experts have all been set up. But then if you take the example of telecoms, which is the centerpiece of the uh, uh, privatization uh, plan, but that's been indefinitely delayed. So they haven't really given reasons for that delay. But I think with the uh, with coronavirus, it seems like this pandemic has thrown a spanner in the works. The government's plans to push forward with this uh, privatization slash liberalization of the economy plan. Emma, but even before the coronavirus, there was a lot of concern about the prospect of Ethiopia's upcoming elections, which were first scheduled for May, then for August, and now have been postponed indefinitely, in part because of the uncertainty caused by the pandemic. This electoral delay raises legal and constitutional questions to which there are no definite answers at this point. But beyond the scheduling of the elections, whenever they might be held, what are your biggest concerns about the electoral process as a whole? One of the litmus tests for uh, this transition is to hold a free, fair and credible elections. If you look at the, the cycle of elections in terms of the pre, during and post election period, we need to also put a context to the election cycle. And three important contexts need to be uh, considered. One is whether the independent uh, board, the election, the national election board, was uh, sufficiently prepared to hold elections or not. And as you can see from the um, composition of the election board, it has been in the process of reconstituting itself uh, by recruiting members, by providing new laws and directives, and also to appointing local uh, officials at different uh, parts of the country. So this part of the process was incomplete uh, even before COVID. Also, the second part should be looked at the political parties themselves. And uh, the political parties are are new, some of them are new, and some of them were rebranding and forming coalitions and so on. And this makes itself also the election timetable because some of them were pushing for or demanding for postponement of elections. And in that context, you can imagine that the political parties were not sufficiently prepared. The third, I would say, is was the environment conducive enough, especially looking at the peace and security of the country where political parties, were they able to campaign freely and were they able to move to the, in the country without any problem? I, I doubt that was the case and that was uh, the reason why many political parties were demanding for postponement of elections. So I think in the time of COVID now we have different multi-layered issues composed of the constitution as well. I think we can look at this moment as an opportunity for both the government and the opposition to find a negotiated timetable for elections. Aaron, can I ask you about the elections as well? Does the delay really matter? Surely being the incumbent put Abby in the strongest position to begin with. Does a delay really change that? We don't have polls in the country to suggest who leads or who's trailing behind. But upon his appointment, of course, the country, there was euphoria the honeymoon phase that ensued. But then ever since, if we talk regionally, from a regional perspective, you have a rebellion that has kicked off in Oromia, in in Western Oromia, and there are accusations of a strong armed response and civil rights violations at the hands of of government troops. That will likely, likely have an impact on how Abiy would perform if the elections were ever held in Oromia. At the same time, you go to Tigray, and then there is a a sense of alienation. You have uh, the uh, governing party there, the TPLF, uh, which has actually announced officially that they will hold elections in August. You could see this in many ways, one of which is them trying to capitalize that sense of marginalization already in Tigray. 
And then you go to the south, a region which is home to over 50 ethnic groups. We live at a time in which several communities, several ethnic groups want to be recognized as ethnic groups. And some of the, the activists, they are accusing the government of not fulfilling its pledges for them to actually be recognized. So these, all, all these issues could play out in the elections and how his prosperity party would perform at the end of the day. So Aaron, if I were to ask you to sum up the situation in Ethiopia, how would you describe it? Very fragile. I would say it's, it's very fragile and, and can take turns for the worse. Of course, one, one issue to highlight, one issue that encapsulates this as well is the uh, political spat with, uh, with the TPLF. They're going to be, it seems, they're bent on holding an election on August 29. We had a response from the government in which they actually said we will take all necessary measures against the TPLF if it does go on, if it does hold elections without any agreement uh, with the federal government. I can sum it up as a very, very fragile process that can go anywhere, really. And Manal, let me put the same question to you. How would you sum up the situation in Sudan? The title of this event is Tenuous Transitions. Does that accurately describe the situation in Sudan? Transition in Sudan is facing a lot of challenges, starting from the unified, strong political leadership that has vision and one unified project that can lead people through the difficult times. Then the lack of international sponsorship for this transition. It's very clear that there is no one strong power behind this transition to lead and to support and to advocate and mitigate for them through these hardship situations and hardship time. So I mean by international sponsorship, a regional mechanism or a country or a friend state or a partner that can really, a regional power that can really help to move and support and push this transition and help to strengthening the situation in Sudan. Then the last things I can see the role of civil society is also start to be very fragile because of the, the civil society itself is start to be highly politicized in Sudan. And then I may add one aspect of the lack of the communication, strategic communication between the government and policymakers and the local communities in Sudan. So all these factors actually is pushing the transition to a very weak and fragile situation. Well, thank you to all of our speakers for your earlier contributions. And now we move to the second part of the event, which is the live question and answer session. So please send in your questions on YouTube and continue to do so. We have some already. Uh, but before we get to those, I just want to turn to Emma Bet and Aaron and ask you, since we've made these recordings, to just update us on this, so there's a lot of legalities to this that are a bit complicated to understand. But what I want to ask you is, what are the implications of the constitutional options that are being considered for the transition in Ethiopia? So if Emma, bet we can start with you and then we'll go to Aaron. Thank you, Ali. Um, so according to the Ethiopian constitution, uh, the incumbent's uh, term will come to an end on the 5th of October. Uh, so that means uh, the government also pre preemptively uh, stepped in and proposed four options. Uh, and those four options were also considered to be uh, from, depending on where you stand, people uh, or political parties uh, said that was that's not an option that uh, we were looking for. Um, I think the options uh, primarily uh, have to do with one, um, you know, uh, the state of emergency, uh, second to uh, dissolve the, the parliament and uh, also form a caretaker government, third to also have the uh, uh, constitution amendment and uh, fourth soliciting constitutional interpretation. So these are the four options that were presented by uh, the government and it, it passed through parliament and approved, uh, the parliament approved that uh, it should be uh, considered, the constitutional interpretation should be considered as one, you know, uh, for the government to uh, consider for constitutional, um, uh, you know, constitutional uh, issues. Uh, I think the uh, uh, 
process in terms of the constitutional interpretation by itself, also depending again where you stand, uh, the political parties uh, ask where this is another jurisdiction of the uh, the um, parliament and also the uh, fact that uh, the parliament passed that uh, the constitution to be interpreted to the council of constitutional inquiry and the, the council also uh, um, had a live debates uh, very interesting uh, moments where people especially uh, the amicus curies have been uh, invited to uh, uh, suggest or to uh, have legal expertise and legal um, legal uh, uh, interpretations. And I think uh, for the first time in the country, because it's historic, uh, people were very excited, uh, but at the same time, there were uh, dissenting opinions that were left out and the process were not considered to be an inclusive one. But again, depending on where you stand, uh, largely uh, we, we can say that the process have been uh, a fair one because uh, we never had this kind of process. Uh, in, uh, sure. Yeah. So, so Aaron, just to add to that, I mean, Emma Betts outlined the options and the possibilities, and we know that there's still a lot of legalities to this. But what I want to ask you is the, the implications of whatever is decided ultimately, and however uh, it is resolved from a legal point of view, we know it's going to result in a delay. That's, that's not in doubt. So what are the implications of that if that continues to, to be um, uncertain? Uh, maybe it has outlined the whole thing, yes. Um, but yeah, so responses to this have, uh, have ranged from you know, outright criticism of the government as if you know, uh, th this was part of the Prime Minister's power-grabbing uh, intentions to, to others who, who, who accept the fact that you know, these are extraordinary circumstances and, and they need uh, extraordinary uh, 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 solutions to it. So you have opposition groups who believe uh, Abi, uh, the country is better off if the ruling party extended its mandate with a reduced mandate, uh, extended its tenure but with a reduced mandate. There are others who believe also that uh, uh, that a caretaker government should be put in place. So it, it's very varied in response uh, and also it's, 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 it's very heated. Uh, but of course, I think any, any repercussions we'll see uh, will depend on how long the elections will be uh, delayed as well, how long coronavirus, uh, the pandemic, has an impact on Ethiopia. Yeah, and Aaron, just one more question for you before we get onto the audience questions. Um, before we recorded, uh, earlier we had recorded you talking about telecoms, and there have been some developments with telecoms since we did that recording. So can you just bring us up to date on what's happened and what's the implication of that, will the government be able to move ahead with the plan it's now announced? Yes, it does seem like now they're going to move ahead uh, with the plan. So what's happened is this month earlier, the the uh, the, uh, the communications body they they announced that they are seeking bidder, uh, bidders, uh, invited and invited participants to submit uh, expressions of uh, of interest. Uh, so this will take place for for, for a month, so uh, until June twenty two. Uh, for, uh, and from then onwards, uh, the the, uh, the com interested companies, which range from, you've got some heavyweights there, the likes of Vodacom and, uh, and some French companies and some South African companies as well, who've all expressed their interest. So they're supposed to also submit a request for a quotation, I think. That's, yeah, so that they're going to submit that. And from then onwards, it seems like it's a clear path to uh, to to... to to having licenses uh, be given. But of course, I think it's important to note that I think there, there's a view in Ethiopia that reflects what this shows you is there's, while the intentions are there, but there's a lack of strategy and that's why the, uh, there's been a delay for this long. Uh, but it seems now that uh, they've, they're moving ahead with it. Okay, thanks. So let's, uh, let's go back to Sudan for a moment and bring in uh, Manal and Peyton into the, the question and answer. So the, the first question I want to put to both of you uh, comes from the audience, which says the transitional process in Sudan is largely hindered by the collapsed economic state. Now, Peyton, we talked earlier a little bit about uh, the economy, and there's a further comment about um, how sanctions imposed on Sudan and still being on the list of state sponsors of terrorism, that's the US government list, and debts 
accumulated are affecting the transition. So can you just help us understand this a bit more long legacy of the sanctions, the SST list? What does this practically mean for what actually can and cannot be done both by the US government, but also by international financial institutes? And then um, I'll ask Manal to come in after Payton's responded just to um, talk about where you see the implications of sanctions still ongoing in Sudan today, if there are, what can be done from your point of view? Uh, thanks, Ali, and thanks for, for pulling together this, uh, this discussion today. Uh, I think you know, the, the state sponsor of terrorism designation uh, or question of whether Sudan should be delisted is, as you know, uh, sort of top of the agenda and has been uh, of the transitional government since it came uh, into power. And the argument is that uh, effectively it impedes two primary uh, functions that Sudan needs for its uh, for its reform efforts and, and in order to address the, to address, as you said, the economic crisis. The first being, uh, it's an impediment to private sector investment, not just from um, from U.S. companies, but uh, there's a uh, it discourages uh, investment from other uh, Western uh, companies as well. Uh, and two, as you alluded to, uh, it uh, prevents the United States from voting in favor of. Um, uh, assistance packages from the World Bank uh, and from the International Monetary Fund. Um, there has been uh, a, a fair amount of effort expended uh, to explore whether Sudan uh, can be delisted. That process is still uh, ongoing. And as I said, that's been a main priority uh, of the transitional government and of, of Prime Minister Hambach. I think as we talked about, though, in the first um, session, or the first part of the discussion, uh, it's really important to appreciate uh, how significantly uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the implications of it on Sudan uh, may require a sort of shift uh, in strategy. I think first, for example, uh, the likelihood of private sector investment, given the global economic downturn, uh, coming to Sudan in the near term is not high. And so to predicate uh, uh, addressing the economic crisis in the country uh, on that uh, may not be uh, the most effective strategy, uh, frankly, in the near term or in the medium term. Um, with respect to the IFIs, though, uh, which I think can play uh, and should play uh, a crucial role, uh, at least in mitigating uh, the most severe fallout uh, economically of the COVID-19 pandemic in Sudan uh, and the inevitable damage that would cause to the reform agenda uh, holistically uh, of the transition, uh, there, there's this question of the IFIs. And uh, in that instance, it's very important to understand that the SST listing, uh, while it does prevent the United States uh, from voting in favor of assistance for Sudan, uh, it does not give, the, the United States doesn't have a veto in these boards. So uh, it is possible for assistance uh, to, to proceed uh, absent support uh, from the United States. The impediment is, as you alluded to, the arrear that Sudan owes to uh, these institutions accumulated during the Bashir uh, regime. Now, I would argue that uh, the uh, given uh, the inflection point that the transition is at, <clears throat> excuse me, given the scope and scale uh, of the consequences of the pandemic, uh, that those institutions and the member states of the board uh, should explore uh, with some urgency creative ways of finding uh, how to best assist Sudan uh, at this crucial time. Yeah, thanks, Peyton. So Manal, we've heard a bit more about the, the background to sanctions, the SST, and what could be done, and Peyton's calling for more creativity to be expressed. What, for you, can be done to improve the economic situation in Sudan, uh, given the, the very real reality of the situation being as dire as it is at the moment? So um, let me go to the, exactly what's the, the implications of the sanction now that can, then we can navigate some creative solutions. Uh, um, for examples, I just wanna give you examples, life examples now Sudanese are suffering, uh, suffering during the uh, COVID-19. Uh, the, the cash transfer, the, the over compliances from the banks in around the world because of the sanction, implication of the sanctions. Now, if you Sudanese people want to send money to their families using the, the just the, Fund, fund trans, cash transfer through the bank, they cannot do that because the banks yeah. have over compliances. Then the, 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 the in telecommunications, it has a problem that doesn't open their IP addresses in Sudan. So people even Zoom, uh, Twitter, uh, Google services that not exist there. So cut off all this uh, Sudan out of these services. Uh, this is part of it. It's, it's complications of the, this problem. The creative, creative uh, um, it's 
could be, something could be done is exactly it's in the lives of the some um, to the need uh, to reach out to these private companies to guide them through their um, compliances. And um, we are hoping that the, the US government can really help to reach out to these private companies or the Sudanese diaspora themselves can reach out to these companies. So because Sudan really depend on um, money coming from um, diaspora to to large extent, families that they need this money. So that's, it, it was a, a source of income for, for a lot of families in Sudan. So, but now they, they, the, mean, the meaning to transfer this money through like, a, a, like a banks, a, a yeah. illegal banks, it's difficult. And we heard from Peyton about the reality of remittances also coming under stress, uh, also for broader economic reasons. Manar, I just want to put another question to you about uh, something else that's come in. What can be done to bring justice to those who were killed in the revolution in Sudan? We're coming up to uh, a number of anniversaries of violence against protesters uh, in Khartoum, but also outside of Khartoum. And there's a, there's a broader question of this justice has been in the news again uh, because of the anniversaries that just to those who have suffered in the revolution in Sudan. Yeah, so what is missing here um, is the transparency and the appearance of what's happening. There is a committee that are doing investigations, but most like Sudanese communities, they don't see what's happening there. There is no, um, there is no, um, statements coming out of this a lot so they can make sure that Sudanese understand there is justice processes is going on. So first we need to bring the transparency to these processes, what's happening there. And then also uh, we need to get people, uh, hold people account, accountable. I know it is a very, very critical situations given the security sector issues, involvement of many actors on this. Uh, so it needs to be um, if we if we need really to emphasize on the institutional and institutional and legal um, and legal reform, we have to emphasize on uh, everybody under the law, nobody above the law. So that's that could be the first approach. Yeah. And then Sudanese so respect that people that talk to them, tell them what's the truth, explain for them if there is a mistake, if there is gaps, you say to them. So that's that's what is missing here: transparency, reflecting what's happening inside this. Uh, committees to, to public. Thanks, Manal. There have been a, a couple of questions about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam that I think everyone will have some views on, but let's first go to Aaron and Emmabet on that. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to the dam, which of course has been under construction for a number of years and has steadily uh, progressed towards completion. And these talks that have been uh, on and off again with uh, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt. But I want to ask you a more domestic question, and this is sort of uh, what I think is important when it comes to the transition first, is what is the effect of this issue on the transition in Ethiopia? Because if we go back a few months ago, there was a narrative in the country that Ethiopia might be uh, pressed into a deal, and this might not be uh, advantageous to Ethiopia's interests. And that produced a lot of nationalist sentiment of, well, actually, this is an Ethiopian issue, and we're all Ethiopians, and nobody should really be interfering in uh, our internal affairs, and uh, perhaps a degree of support for the government. So I just wanted to ask you if you agreed with that sort of swell of support, whether that was just a temporary moment, or whether as a issue of political transition, the question of the dam in Ethiopia also has electoral potential or potential for Abiy or others to uh, gain support uh, within the broader Ethiopian constituency. So Aaron first and then Emma Bet. Uh, I, I don't think of, I can't think of any issue that really binds together Ethiopians uh, as much as the Grand Renaissance Dam does. So anyone across the spectrum uh, does uh, shares the same opinion of it, uh, the, uh, the importance of the country to the country's, uh, of the project to the country's economy, uh, electrification, at the same time uh, generating foreign currency through exports as well. So if you can, you can speak to everyone from the staunchest critic of the prime minister to, 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 to any affiliated parties, they will, they will 
they, they do see uh, the importance of this project. Um, but as far as uh, either the talks are concerned, yes, so the, the ground to a halt, ETF is pushing through uh, with the project. Uh, but for me, I think, you know, at the heart of it, I think there's, there's just deep mistrust between the two. Uh, on one hand, you have uh, Egypt, which doesn't seem to, which seems to, you know, to be convinced that Ethiopia has other ulterior motives, that Ethiopia plans to build irrigation projects. I think that's at the heart of, you know, uh, of, 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 of the, at the heart of why it's been stuck so far, that they haven't really moved forward with talks. On the, on, on the other hand, you have Ethiopia, which uh, does, uh, uh, which which is suspicious of Egypt's uh, motives. Uh, you know, it, you know uh, at, at several points, uh, Ethiopia, um, uh, the talks have dragged on. Ethiopia believes uh, Egypt is trying to push the agenda towards the share, the liable share of the... Of, yeah. of, uh, well, we'll come back to Egypt's uh, role in just a second, but maybe, Amabet, just to comment on the domestic angle of this. Obviously, there are wider regional aspects to consider, but just thinking about how this issue plays inside the country, what's your view? Uh, I totally agree with Aaron. I think the Nile, uh, the Grand Renaissance, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is the one, uh, I think, one, uh, one significant uh, national agenda that unites Ethiopians across the board. And uh, you can see uh, from the inauguration of the, uh, you know, when the dam was announced, uh, when the building of the dam was announced, uh, the, the all Ethiopians, I would say, across the boards were even buying bonds from, you right. know, from, Shoe shine guy to you know uh, someone working in the public sector and uh, to the private sector. So I think the issue of the Nile is something that uh, unites every Ethiopian and it's existential as it is existential to uh, Egyptians. So it's uh, so because it yeah. yeah so because it does unite people. Is it something which can be used by the incumbent? government and how will that work i mean is it something that will be useful to it in an eventual election for example uh, possibly i think uh, like i said uh, if you remember in 2011 when the whole arab uprising uh, began in egypt and uh, in the middle east uh, you, you you've seen uh, the tensions rising at that time in ethiopia as well and uh, you know at that time the late prime minister uh, melissa nawi you, you know used that agenda to unite everyone in ethiopia so you can use the uh, agenda to unite everyone in ethiopia based on you know the benefit that it provides and also the uh, you know it, it can divert any divert attentions from the political uh, tensions that are building up. So even at the time of COVID, people are really strongly uh, uh, you know, backing the government's position to uh, go front and uh, center on that. All right. Peyton, there are wider regional questions when it comes to the, the Nile and the dam and all of the downstream and upstream implications of this. Sudan is in the middle of this. Sudan has interests and equities in both directions, looking north, uh, looking downstream, uh, as well as looking upstream, and so far has sort of managed to balance its role. I don't know how you would evaluate it, but it seems fairly successfully uh, to the extent that uh, there is success in this equation. Uh, Sudan is now also proposing that it could perhaps get more involved in the discussions between Egypt and Ethiopia that may occur? I mean, how do you evaluate, how do you assess things moving forward? Uh, well, I mean, as you may have seen, Ali, just uh, within the last week, uh, Prime Minister Hamdok uh, convened a meeting of, uh, virtually, uh, of Egyptian and, uh, and Ethiopian officials, including Prime Minister Abiy, uh, precisely to that end. Uh, and I think has been uh, the United States some months ago uh, launched its own mediation effort uh, between Egypt and Ethiopia to find a way forward. Um, my understanding is that uh, the Sudanese uh, have been asked to assist uh, with that by the U.S. administration. And you know, there's reason to believe, as you said, that Sudan could perhaps play uh, a useful role uh, as an interlocutor between Egypt and Ethiopia, uh, whose politics, I mean, as our colleagues from Ethiopia explained, uh, politics both in Egypt and in Ethiopia are extremely uh, uh, locked in uh, on this issue, and there's a lot of uh, passion and emotion around it. So uh, certainly, if, if, if Sudan could play a role in, in moderating that, uh, that could be very helpful. Uh, I must say, I think, um, uh, uh, I, I think it's a source of great uh, risk uh, 
uh, and, uh, and possible tension and escalation uh, in the coming months. So I'm glad actually that this Nile issue has been raised today because when you think about it in the context of how tenuous the Sudanese and Ethiopian transitions are uh, and, the, and the range of external powers that have uh, engaged in those transitions, uh, not just because of the dam, but, uh, but can be certainly caught up in that, uh, it certainly heightens the risks uh, to some extent of, of regional uh, volatility at potentially precisely the wrong moment, right? As you're heading into this very uh, sensitive constitutional discussion in Ethiopia uh, and amidst all of the challenges that we've elaborated on uh, with respect to the Sudanese transition. And, and Manal, I want to pick up on that last point of Payton for you. The Sudanese transitional government has plenty to do and we'll talk about some of those things uh, later. But when it comes to the, the dam, obviously Sudan is not the, the principal actor in this conversation. Is it really um, a useful thing for Prime Minister Hamdok to get involved in, given all of the other priorities of the Sudanese transition? Or how do you see Sudan's involvement uh, potentially detracting from many other priorities and many other limitations of the transition in Sudan? I, I, I totally believe that Sudan uh, needs to expand uh, the regional connections, especially in East Africa. And Ethiopia and Egypt, they are very important for Sudan stability itself. Sure. So um, having, uh, having a lot of to do and uh, the prime ministers and the go transition government plate, uh, it's yes, it's overwhelming, but ext uh, ex extended to outside to the regional, um, regional issues, it's really important, especially the dam, the, 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 the building of the dam, it's, it's important for Sudan itself. It's important for Sudan, for the economy of Sudan, and also uh, it may affect positively or negatively. Sudan, it needs to be involved in this part of this. Then it's about diplomacy and about reaching out and connecting Sudan with the regional dynamics. So it's not just about Sudan as a country. Is It's very important and it's very a smart move to have Sudan, the leadership to, to extend their uh, diplomacy, their involvement at the regional level. Even the international community has to look to Sudan as a regional uh, dimensions, not from, from the regional, regional dynam dimensions, not only just country as a, a locked country, because yeah. Sudan is actually has a lot of uh, impact on the other neighboring countries and in the whole region. Right. So that's, 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 that's I think it's, it's, it's must, they, we, have to, we have to involve in the regional okay. because Thanks. we are a player in right. that. Uh, Emma Bet, there's a question uh, specifically directed to you, but I'll also ask uh, Manal to comment, uh, which is about the role of local CSOs, civil society organizations. And the question is, do you think that local CSOs could have a role in bringing the discussions amongst the political parties? And if so, how? And Manal, I'll ask you after Emma Bet's finished also to respond to that question, because you mentioned the, the role of political parties in the Sudanese transition. But starting with Ethiopia, how can CSOs play a more effective role uh, amongst the political parties? Uh, thanks for that question. It's a very important one. I think uh, the last at least one and a half years since um, you know, the, new, the, the new dispensation, uh, we've seen the role of civil society uh, to, you know, to come and play the role that uh, any civil society in any country would do. Uh, I think, unfortunately, in Ethiopia, the space has been, uh, to some extent, closed uh, uh, for the last 10 years. And for civil society to come out and do the role that is expected from them was uh, a difficult part. We've seen that in the last one and a half years. And they are already you know, uh, in a state of uh, reluctance and you know, to come out and have a discussion, not only on the politics, but also on different agendas that the country is driving. So the role of civil society in different aspects of the country has been uh, not really significant, but I would I wouldn't say even to uh, to the extent that they would come and you know create a space for political parties to negotiate. But I think um, you know now the time uh, during this period, it's it's also very difficult to uh, for civil society to come and uh, bring political parties to have a debate or to have a discussion that would chart the way forward for the country. So uh, the the. I think the one important uh, aspect would be the state of civil society the last in the last 10 years haven't been conducive and it really led to a situation for civil society not to uh, fulfill uh, their roles in, in, in uh, any um, situation like that. So, uh, okay. but I hope, I hope that it will uh, come uh, sooner. 
And, and Manal, what about Sudan? Is there a role for civil society organizations when it comes to political parties and perhaps more widely, if we can talk about in terms of the transition as a whole and a transitional government, what's the role for civil society there? So um, let, us, let us agree first, we need strong political parties and we need strong civil society to have a real democracy in Sudan. What's happening in Sudan in the few past years, uh, Sudan, one of the biggest hub for humanitarian aid. So our, the civil society in Sudan is mostly oriented towards uh, humanitarian support and also service providing, which is taking a lot from the real, uh, the, the political role for this civil society to play in the as the political players in, demo in transitional democracy. So that's, that's, that's what's been said. Uh, the, the current situation for political, for the civil society is it start to be interact with their political uh, parties, political parties. So it's very highly politicized. They, 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 that's the role, the anticipated role for civil society and the democracy is about monitoring the process and the um, uh, performance of the government. Now, what's happening is actually the, there is a lot of um, interact, there is a lot of um, mix between the political parties and civil society, the civil society is really following what their political parties want them to say, which is really taking a lot from their um, anticipated role in democracy. So that's one of the, one of, one of the challenging, uh, one of the challenges on this, on the civil society and in, in the country. And then the maturity itself, the maturity of civil society and how to handle the, the, the movement, the democratic, democratic movement. So they need experience, exposure, and especially during the past years, uh, the brief, brief regime really make it very narrow space for them to have more maturity on term of understanding the, the role of civil society in democracy. Yeah. Um, Aaron, let's come back to you. There's a comment and a question and I'll, I'll just combine them. There's a comment that the federal system in Ethiopia is breaking down and you spoke earlier in the recorded session about uh, the situation between the central government and uh, Tigre. Um, so I would just ask you if you agree with that sort of characterization, is the federal system in Ethiopia breaking down? And relatedly, what kind of transition are we talking about in Ethiopia? What has really changed? Is it just a matter of faces? And do we know our collective destination when it comes to Ethiopia? So um, Aaron, if you could respond to those comments. I, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's broken down, but uh, I, would, I would certainly say it's come under strain. Uh, you know, you, you have the administrations of uh, uh, in, in the administrations in provinces. Uh, they themselves be, um, making their own decisions and, and taking their own actions. For instance, I think case in point is you know the uh, relationship uh, between the, 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 the administration of Tigray and the central government is one one example. We also have other cases too. Uh, I, I think it's it's varied in some places. Uh, uh, up, for instance, in Amhara, they've had issues with the, with the central government. Uh, you, yeah, you, you see them taking unilateral action. So it's definitely under strain, but I wouldn't really go that far as saying it's, 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 uh, it's broken down. But of course, with the elections yeah. coming up, if they ever uh, are held, held at the end of the day, I think it will have huge implications on well, what sort of relationship they will have uh, between the, uh, the center and, and, and everybody else. And you know, what, about the reality, what about the reality of the transition? What's really changed? Is it just a matter of faces? And do we know our collective destination or does Ethiopia know its collective destination? In, in fairness to, 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 to uh, Prime Minister Abiy, I think you know, the, the, uh, some you know, uh, groundbreaking uh, uh, changes have taken place in the country. Uh, some are still... Uh, at the early, uh, the early phase. So it's, it's changes have definitely taken place, but then more are bound to happen. But the litmus test obviously will be the election, um, and which we don't know when it will ever take place. Uh, so from, from that perspective, you might say, you know, it hasn't really gone as far as it, sh it should, uh, but at the same time, there are circumstances have also led to its, uh, to its, uh, its post uh, postponement delay as well. So, uh, so we have a lot, a lot coming up uh, in, in the next uh, uh, months or year, or year as well, next 12 months or year. 
Emmabet, Emmabet, let me put the same question to you about the collective destination. Do you feel Ethiopians know the collective destination of the country? And relatedly, what are some ways you think leaders throughout Ethiopia could address rising tensions, whether those are ethnic or regional or interpersonal or intercommunal of other kinds? So what can leaders throughout Ethiopia do to address tensions? And do you think Ethiopia knows its collective destination? Um, thanks. I think by uh, collective destination, I don't know what I'm, you know, in terms of, uh, because if it, if it comes to the political uh, domain or the political parties, the government, I don't, I, I mean, there is, like I said, uh, there's incoherence. And there is actually from uh, the ruling party, the reform started within the party itself, and it had uh, uh, rolled out different uh, uh, policies, reforms, so which uh, is, is a kind of a way uh, to something, but I, do, I don't think there is a destination that is being uh, mooted from, you know, different parts of uh, the, the, the opposition and be it also with the government. But there is uh, the notion of prosperity, which I, I don't know how people would relate to, uh, the, the, you know, individuals, ordinary people in Ethiopia, how they would feel or how they would um, relate themselves with the, uh, that proposition of prosperity. So uh, there is, you know, ideological gaps, there is uh, also philosophical gaps. So that uh, is, uh, actually the one that makes the transition very difficult because uh, people have different interpretations. Uh, the, even the party, the uh, members of the party have different interpretations of the uh, ideologies. So the common destination, I don't know if, that, okay. if that's going to be formed. Um, uh, the second question you raised was the... The second question um, is what can leaders do to address rising tensions? Yeah, I think the, the grounding rule should be the de-escalation. De and in any peace and conflict uh, issues, you have to de-escalate tensions rising from uh, be it at the local level, at the federal level. All we see now between you know uh, altercations between regional uh, governments and also federal government has to be maintained and managed in a, in a conflict sensitive manner. And so uh, if we really apply the rules and you know principles of peace building, the do no harm approach and conflict sensitivity should be applied across you know, government, across civil society, across activists, media, all of this should be, you know, combined and work together to, to uh, uh, abate uh, or uh, reduce tensions in the country. Thanks. Uh, Peyton, there's a question specific yeah. for you. We could uh, come back to Sudan for a moment. Um, there's a question about internal security issues and splits and security civilians but how does the in Sudan and regional foreign policy of Sudan in particular? Uh, you cut out a little bit, Ali, but I think if I understood the question correctly, it was about the intersection of internal fissures within security elements and regional uh, politics. Um, as I we sort of talked about in the, in the initial part of the discussion, I think the, te the conventional wisdom has been to look at, at Sudan as a binary contest between civilian and security actors. And that, uh, to a great degree, obscures uh, the diversity and, to some extent, the polarization within the security elements of the country and, frankly, within various civilian uh, groups uh, and factions within, within Sudan. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, from, uh, frankly, prior to the to Bashir's removal from power, but certainly since then, uh, a number of uh, regional actors uh, have uh, identified various uh, security and civilian uh, partners in Sudan who they believe uh, may best uh, advance their own uh, interests. And I think uh, certainly the United States and, and other uh, Western actors uh, need to be very uh, careful uh, in not losing sight of this. I think when you look north to the situation in Libya, uh, it provides a cautionary tale for Sudan uh, and uh, and illustrates the significant risks of when a conflict, and, and, and in Sudan's case, a transition, uh, becomes internationalized to such an extent that internal uh, factionalism is exacerbated by uh, the import uh, of, regional, uh, of regional interests. And uh, the stakes are so high for Sudan uh, at this critical time uh, that I think it is a real risk. Uh, one of the challenges, uh, as, as everyone has, is aware, uh, facing the transition is in fact the conduct of foreign relations. And uh, because the constitutional declaration itself uh, is somewhat ambiguous on uh, which uh, parts of the transitional government 
uh, have the lead on foreign relations. It's become a particularly fraught uh, uh, and, and tension inducing uh, issue. And uh, the United States and others, I think, need to work with the full range of Sudan's neighbors, of those in the near abroad in the Middle East, uh, Turkey, elsewhere, uh, to make sure that uh, that some of the fault lines within the country are not further exacerbated by, uh, by regional interventions. And as I said, by the sort of internationalization uh, of the transition, which will, will only undermine its success. Thanks, Peyton. Manal, let me ask you to also comment on the Sudan foreign policy question. And the, the question really is about these internal splits between civilians and between the security actors. How does that affect the conduct of Sudan's foreign policy? And what are your concerns? Yeah, so um, the, 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 the partnership between the military and the, and the, and the civilians, uh, to a large extent, it's affecting the the international um, foreign policy, because the civilian uh, representation, the representation for Sudan has to be civilians. But at the same time, the, the military uh, leadership are heavily engaged on the region, especially if there is some uh, power, regional power has interest to be engaged directly with them. So that's actually taking a lot from the uh, demo, demo, uh, demographic um, civilians to be actually at, this, at the face for this uh, for this transition, so giving that um, the interactions and the interest between some regional power and the military and the uh, security forces is taking a lot from the international appearance for the civilians' leadership. That's what well, that's in one yeah. hand, and then internally itself, or also it's um, it's created a lot of uh, tension and created a lot of um, uh, it created a lot of questions. I mean about where this uh, partnership will lead the country. Right, but now one more question for you, which is where are negotiations in Sudan going in terms of creating a secular country or a secular nation? Can you comment on that? So that's actually, that is the 1 million question because now we are, have, we are here, like uh, the, the, the negotiation in Juba is really uh, become like a little bit um, isolated so there is not a lot coming from Juba to the rest of the world. But uh, going back to, going, oh, I mean, to, Sud to Sudanese communities, going back to your questions is the secular state, Sudanese uh, revolution, when they came out against the Bashir, they are claiming a, a justice and, and um, democracy, which i.e. is a secular state because they've been persecuted by, under the uh, name of the religions for long time. That statement itself, it doesn't give the guarantees for a lot of political parties to claim it again. So it exists. It's in Sudanese a call for the revolution. Having that, uh, there is a legitimate struggle for some groups like Nuba, Nuba people. It's a legitimate struggle. It's a le legitimate demand because there is not all of them, they are in one page, they want the uh, they, they actually, I mean, they want, um, they don't want to be under any religious regime. And they went through a lot. So there is some legitimacy on their questions. But um, at the same time, yeah. um, that's what makes the, the, the transitional government makes it very difficult for them to wait in between and to balance between this demand at the same time. Sudanese majority are Muslims. And yes. it's being manipulated the world of secularism itself, it's been manipulated through the history. So it's become like something that people will feel that like it's not good. It's insulting for their beliefs and for religions. So that works, it needs to be gone through educations, through um, uh, if we need an stable democracy, we have to have a freedom of religious, we have to have respect of religious. So that okay. could be like um, discussed on the, uh, come out in the constitutions, yeah. Thanks, Manal. Uh, let me go back to Emmabet and Aaron. So Emmabet, is there trust, or can there be trust that Abiy Ahmed, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, will implement democracy in Ethiopia? So if you could address that question. And Aaron, let me put the question about, is it possible to have a true federal system in Ethiopia? And if so, is that the best political solution for Ethiopia in your view? So first, Emmabet. Yeah, I think, uh, again, I think the two years of transition and I think the, the way uh, every 
the expectation from the political parties, from every corner of uh, a section of the society expects democracy to be delivered. And one litmus test, like I said earlier, is the uh, conduct of free, fair and credible election. And if uh, Dr. Abiy Ahmed is uh, considered to be one who facilitates that transition, I think democracy is, at, at least we say we are in the beginning of democratic uh, transition. And if that, uh, if that uh, hope is quashed, I think there will be a lot of uh, disappointment. Okay. Aaron, what about the question of federalism? Is it possible to have a true federal system in Ethiopia? And is that the best solution for Ethiopia? I think it's it's the only solution for Ethiopia. I think uh, you know, as as activists and other historians have said, Ethiopia is a, a nation of nations and not a single entity. Uh, so anything but that kind of sort of system can can is a recipe for disaster. The question is is uh, is implementation, uh, and it hasn't been implemented well. I think uh, uh, the focus should be on on rectifying. Uh, the wrongs done in the past to, to, to make it a workable situation. Of course, uh, uh, right now, uh, there is a view that uh, the prime minister might have a different uh, plan for, for the country in terms of the way he wants to govern it. Uh, and that emanates from the fact that he united the ruling party into a single party, the prosperity party. But there's absolutely no indication that he has any other, he, ha he harbors any any other uh, other plans. But that's, uh, I think I, uh, that's, for me, that's the only uh, uh, system that can work in the country. And Aaron, if I could just ask you to comment very briefly on a follow-up question, uh, which is about uh, Abiy Ahmed as well. Some say Abiy Ahmed was too soft on law enforcement in the early days of him coming into office, which led to a breakdown in peace and security. So is the recent consolidation a good step? Just a, a brief response to that, if you would. Yes, there are accusations that he was quite soft, but I think he was trying to bring everyone on board initially. Uh, but right now it's completely different. In Oromia, the army has been deployed. Uh, they, are fire, they, 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 they are carrying out an offensive against rebels. Uh, so, so I think those, get, those days uh, are gone. He's, he's pretty much uh, involving the military now in terms of trying to, 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 uh, to, to stabilize uh, unstable areas of the country. Um, I, I want to put a question to, to all of you, and we're just coming to the, to the end almost of our time, but is there a role for regional bodies to aid a smooth transition? And this is relevant to both countries. Of course, it's always interesting when we talk about this in the Ethiopian context, because Ethiopia has historically been uh, a very important player in the region for all the other countries, not, not in, also including Sudan. Um, so is there a role for regional bodies when it comes to Ethiopia? And then uh, we'll talk, take that question to Sudan. So Emma Bet, just very briefly, if you could respond to that. Yes, uh, I think uh, what comes first in mind is uh, one, Ethiopia, especially Addis Ababa, is the host of the uh, continental body, the African Union, and uh, whatever happens in the Ethiopian context will affect directly affect the African Union. So it's not by uh, choice, but by necessity that the African Union should be active and engage with the different actors, especially one in terms of early warnings, uh, in place, put in place mechanisms in terms of mediation. And also I think the, uh, the big uh, aspect would be the elections and the uh, political affairs of the African Union, for example, can you know, assist and help the, the, the Ethiopian government, but also the, the uh, institutions to democratize and also help it to become a, a successful transition. And uh, I think the role of IGAD has been also immensely Big in terms of mediation roles and uh, also having the uh, current executive secretary as Ethiopian uh, would have also a big role to play, in my opinion. Manal, just briefly, what more from the region would you like to see when it comes to Sudan? You've talked about international sponsorship, but can we be more specific when we talk about the region? What can the region do to help shore up the Sudanese transition? I may be more specific, and we really need uh, the, the, the regional power or regional partnership in two, two areas. First, in economy. We have an opportunities coming in Berlin for the international uh, conference with the Sudan friends and partners, which is really if we have a country like, um, like uh, Ethiopia, which is uh, 
have a, a, a amazing experience in bringing outside investors, international investors to their country. They can really help to push for Sudan in, in speci specifically on the file of the economy. And, uh, and then we have, um, I, I want to see more role for EGAD in, in these, these uh, talks in Juba. So they have amazing experience in the past during the South Sudan peace agreements. So we want to see that role actually more activated and we want it to be more strong. So, and also COMESA, the, 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 the regional mechanism in okay. East Africa. Those all this role we need to, to see. It Thanks country. Manal. Hayden, we're coming to time. So I just want to put a final question to you and then a final same question to um, Aaron and Emmabet. We've heard lots of differences, lots of similarities in terms of two very fraught and tenuous political transitions in two very important countries. Do you see things that can be learned from one transition to another? Are there things that might be applicable to the Ethiopian context from the Sudanese experience and vice versa? Uh, you know, maybe I'll answer that question related also to your previous question, which is that I think one of the um, success stories actually about international engagement uh, in Sudan uh, was the extent to which the African Union took a very strong position early on about the necessity of having a civilian-led uh, transition and was prepared to back that, uh, not just with the threat of punitive action uh, against those who would obstruct that transition, but by withholding uh, legitimate recognition of the transition until it had a civilian character. And I think as we look at both the transition in Sudan, but also, also the transition to Ethiopia, it's going to be crucial for the full range of international actors to underscore consistently and on a sustained basis that the reform agenda of both needs to remain front and center. I think the risk, uh, certainly at this time of the pandemic and an economic crisis, uh, will inevitably be a tilt uh, towards authoritarian and securitized uh, responses, not just in these countries, but elsewhere. Uh, and it's all the more important that multilateral institutions uh, and governments around the world uh, underscore, uh, as I said, consistently, uh, that the reform agenda that animated these transitions in the first instance needs to remain the core uh, of the process going forward and that they cannot be personalized uh, around the ambitions of specific individuals, either in Ethiopia uh, or in Sudan. And Aaron, the last uh, word on that question to you, just very briefly, are there things that can be learned from the two transitions? Do you think there are lessons that can be um, identified even at this early stage? Uh, yes, very tenuous both. I think uh, what needs to be done in both cases is uh, having expanding the pool of stakeholders as much as you can. I think Abi Abi is trying to do that. Uh, Manal is uh, is in a far better position to tell to, to speak about Sudan. I think I think those these are the shared shared similarities between the, the need to, to 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 bring everyone on board in in in, in this very tenuous stage of uh, of the country's history. Well, thanks to all of you for joining us and staying on the line and responding to so many questions. Aaron Masho and Emma Beg Gattachu in Addis Ababa, Manal Taha and Peyton Noff in Washabat, USIP. Please visit www.usip.org. Thanks. Thanks for hosting us. <laughs>